What I'd like to do now is uh, introduce our third presenter that'll wrap us up before that Q&A. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming Emily Skogrand, who is a clinical pharmacist at Oregon Health Science University. Uh, Emily splits her time between an inpatient internal medicine service and OHSU's addiction consult service, working to optimize the care of SUD patients throughout our community. Get ready. This is going to be fascinating. Please join me in welcoming Emily Skogrand. Thanks for the introduction, Paul. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about hospital management of opiate use disorder. So hospitalization is a key moment to engage and to support our patients with OUD, and we've seen an increasing need for hospital care as well. In the U.S., uh, at least one out of nine hospitalized patients have a substance use disorder, and hospitalization for many in our, in our rural communities are one of the few opportunities they do have to receive treatment. Um, Unfortunately, hospitalized patients have a very similar death rate to those who have heart attacks. A recent study done in Oregon found that almost 8% of patients with OUD died within 12 months of being discharged. Um, only about 13, 15% of those were from overdose. So the overdose part of it is really just the tip of the iceberg. They're dying from other things. Uh, we know that an interprofessional addiction consult service does improve patient care. It improves provider experience. It makes hospitals more trauma-informed care and responsive to the needs of the people who use drugs. Not all hospital systems are able to support this, um, but all hospitals should start offering basic OUD care, including acute withdrawal management and then medications for OUD. Um, so hopefully today my slides will get you, give you some tools to start providing MOUD care in your hospital setting. Uh, Dr. Reiser uh, hit on the language part of it. I do just want to emphasize a few things as far as drug therapy goes. So ideally, we're going to stop using opiate substitution therapy. I think this is a misconception that you're substituting one quote unquote addiction for another. Uh, we also want to stop using MAT or medication assisted treatment. This implies that the medication is just supplemental or temporary. I think MOUD or medication for opiate use disorder um, just aligns better with way other medic medication therapies understood. You know, we know metformin is critical for diabetes and SSRIs are really great tools for depression. And it just that terminology aligns more with other disease state treatments. Um, Scooting along to fentanyl pharmacokinetics. Uh, these two words have been said multiple times throughout this presentation. Um, so when I think of fentanyl, two words that comes to your mind um, should be potent and lipophilic. Potent, we know the potency of it, 30 to 50 times more potent than the heroin we're used to, 80. I've seen reports up to 800 or 1,000 times more potent than the prescription morphine, especially when we're talking about carfentanil. And then it has very high affinity at the mu receptors. And the mu receptors are part of our brain that's responsible for the euphoria, for the analgesia, but then also the respiratory depression um, when opiates are used. Lipophilic is another word. Lipophilic just means that it likes fat. Um, and a lot of what we know from the illicit fentanyl is kind of gathered from what we know of the prescription fentanyl. So fentanyl, we think of, I kind of think of as a three compartment model. So you, when fentanyl hits the system, it's going to very rapidly cross that blood brain barrier because it is so lipophilic. It takes about two to five minutes for it to, to go into your brain and start um, working. This effect we think is probably relatively short, probably one to two hours, maybe up to three to four. Um, and then right around the 15 to 25 minute mark, it starts redistributing out of the, the CNS into the serum and then into the fatty tissues, where it remains for quite a few days. Uh, with persistent use, we can see positive UAs for up to 21 days after last use, um, but it's usually around seven to the 14 day mark. So for hospital admissions, there's two important things I want you to think of first. One, uh, supportive medications. How can we make this person more comfortable? And two, I want you to think of naloxone. So this is just the basics on how to administer naloxone. Uh, naloxone does not need a prescription. Any pharmacist can prescribe it. Uh, not all pharmacies do, however. So if you are a prescriber, I do think it's helpful just to send a prescription to the pharmacy. It reduces some of the stigma and maybe just the concern about going and asking for a prescription. 
Um, and in exciting news, the FDA is reviewing it this month, um, and hopefully it will be over the counter um, as soon as this summer. Um, one do an important point that I would want to call out specifically on this slide is number seven. So once you've administered naloxone to the person and they've responded, it's very important to tell them that you've given them Narcan so they know what to expect. Oftentimes they'll go into the draw, they won't feel good, and just giving them the heads up that that's what you've done to them is the very kind thing to do. I think there's been a lot of chats about, um, oh, sorry, uh, real quick, some risk factors for overdose. I do want to mention these because a few of them are applicable to the hospital setting. Uh, they include mixing alcohol, mixing opiates with alcohol, lower tolerance after hospitalization, incarceration, or drug treatment, co-occurring acute illness, if there's any change in drug supply, if they've had a history of overdose, and then if they're using in a new environment. Naloxone and fentanyl, I think there's some concern that it doesn't work anymore. There has, there's some actually de pretty decent papers out there describing the rise in need for multiple doses of naloxone to reverse it. This is both from EMS and then patient reports. Uh, I've also seen some data out there based on PK models where they essentially predict a faster reduction in fentanyl occupancy at the mu receptors with higher doses of naloxone. So what these researchers did was compare low, mid, and high fentanyl exposures to what was essentially four and eight milligrams of the nasal naloxone. And the model predicted that it would take less than five minutes to reduce fentanyl exposure by 50% um, in the high fentanyl exposure group with eight milligrams, but not with four milligrams. Um, it's interesting data. It is a pharmacokinetic model and not real life. I still think that naloxone is still really effective. It's going to get the fentanyl off the receptors. I think it's important to counsel our patients. It's not uncommon to need a second dose, so keep that two pack together. And then it's also important to call 911 in case more naloxone is needed. It is commercially available as four and eight milligrams nasal spray. Both are covered on the care organ formulary. A little bit of a word of caution um, with eight milligrams. It's not as common. It may be harder to find in the community pharmacies. So if you have one shot for that person to pick up the naloxone, I'd stick with a four milligrams. I'd hate for that person to present to the pharmacy. The pharmacy says, I don't have it, I have to order it in. Um, and, you know, and the odds of that person coming back in the next few days to pick it up might be lower. So stick with the four milligrams unless you're certain that your, your local pharmacy does have that eight milligrams on the, shop, on the shelf. And then I mentioned naloxone as being one of the first things I want you to think of um, in hospital admission. Just to increase the likelihood that the person will leave with a naloxone in hand. You know, patient-directed discharges, um, rush DC plans are not totally uncommon. And so if we pre-plan, the, there'll be a higher incidence of them leaving with it. If you're lucky enough to have an outpatient pharmacy attached to your hospital, I uh, highly recommend sending it there. If you have a meds to bed program, getting it delivered early in the stay. Um, or, you know, if the patient's able, if you allow your patients to go outside, have the patients walk over to the pharmacy and pick it up themselves afterwards. Okay, let's talk about acute withdrawal management. Um, the first thing I want you to think of acute withdrawal management is opiates. Opiates are really the mainstay of withdrawal management. Usually, especially in the setting of fentanyl, we're going to rely heavily on our short-acting full agonists. So that's like your oxycodone, your hydromorphone, or your morphine. Methadone and buprenorphine are also um, really good options that I'll, I'll talk about how to transition onto. And then it's, I think, very important to partner with your patients to determine which is most helpful for them. What's worked in the past for them, what hasn't worked, what traumatizing experience that may they have had that they really just want to avoid, um, and then supportive medications. Dr. Hartley talked um, significantly about them, so I'll spend, I, I'll kind of glaze over that. I do want to, however, encourage hospital systems to make them standard. Uh, the more standardized they are, the more familiar they'll be, uh, the, the more familiar the staff will be with them, which just means it'll be more likely for your patients to be able to receive them. Uh, if you are a health system that uses EPIC, they, EPIC has a med panel order, so it's different than an order set. It's pretty, pretty easy. You just type in opiate supportive medication. These six medications come up, and then they're put on the patient's profile. Let's talk a little bit more in depth about methadone. So just some of the, do the 
dosing basics. It is a full agonist. Methadone peaks in about four hours. Uh, it's bolded because that will be important for some of our treatment options later on. It has a really long duration of action and it does this really fun thing well, where it takes a few days to get to steady state. So you see this graph over here, the pink line is the serum levels of methadone. The bottom axis is time in days and you can see it doesn't quite reach steady state until about three, but really more like four to five days. That makes the titration of it, initial titration of it, of it, especially in the setting of fentanyl, a little bit tricky. There are a lot of drug-drug interactions. It's um, metabolized through 3A4, so make sure you consult your pharmacist. And then there's some controversy over when and what to do with the QTC. Uh, you know, in the hospital, we're lucky enough to have EKGs, you know, relatively easy to obtain one. So I think it's very reasonable to check a baseline QTC. I would use the QTCF, not the QTCB. There's a few different formulations out there. If your health system does not automatically calculate the F for you, um, you know you can find calculators online for them. The F is just more accurate in drug-related QTC prolongation, and the B often very much overestimates it. Uh, I would say usually we'd avoid it if the baseline QTC is greater than 500. And then if it does prolong with dose increases, and it's really a risk versus benefit discussion with a patient. And oftentimes what we'll do, you know, if we jump from 100 to 120 and their QTG, QTC jumps up to 520, we go back to the 100 and then we do a slower dose increase. So maybe we go up to 105 for a few days and 110 for a few days and just make a, a slower dose adjustments. I get this question a lot. Is it legal to start or adjust methadone doses during hospitalization? And the answer is definitely yes. So the federal code um, is fairly wordy, but it does limit methadone treatment for OUD to, li to license opiate treatment centers or OTPs. But they do have this little caveat in there that it says that this section is not intended to put any limitation on physicians to administer narcotic drugs in a hospital to maintain or de detoxify a person if they're admitted for anything else other than addiction. So this really gives us legal protection to start and adjust methadone in the hospital setting. So just a few little tips before we do it. Don't forget about your supportive medications. There's going to be super important partner with your patient um, to discuss which symptoms are bothering them most. Let them know what they have available on their MAR for it. Use specific names. Um, so they know what to ask their nurse for. Uh, if there's any concern about them not getting it, you know, if a lot of patients are boarded in the ED uh, or the nursing ratio isn't ideal, schedule that medications it's appropriate with holding parameters on there. So if the patient's super agitated, put clonidine 0.1 on their TID and then just say holds for heart rate and blood pressures. And then I think a really huge key on here, and I probably should have bolded this, is we have to really rely on short acting opiates to manage withdrawal or cravings while we're up titrating the methadone. So this right here is a example of a standard induction. I would say this is what we would normally do pre-setting a fentanyl. If you are not a hospital system that is already utilizing methadone starts, I think this is a, a very conservative and safe place to start to kind of get your feet wet. Um, and then as you get more comfortable with this, you can increase um, up to uh, maybe a higher dose or faster titration that I'll talk about next. Uh, so high tolerance inductions, and this is what I would use in the setting of, of fentanyl. So anyone who's using any more than 10 or more pressed fentanyl tablets a day or using any form of powdered fentanyl IV. Uh, this is where we know that standard induction that I had on that last screen probably isn't going to cut it. Unfortunately, there's no clear standard. We don't really know how to safely get people up to these effective doses in the time that they need to. A uh, few strategies. One is to re rely heavily on appropriate doses of short acting opiates. Um, and appropriate doses is not 5 to 15 of oxycodone. These patients are going to need more like 15 to 30 of oxycodone, 4 to 8 of hydromorphone. Um, I think it's 
good to split doses. So we do know that methadone peaks in four hours. And so if you're going to see sedation off the methadone, you'll see it at that four hour mark. And so, you know, if we really want to get 60 milligrams in them all at day one, using a split dosing, so doing 30 twice daily or 20 twice daily with some PRN doses in there is a good strategy. Uh, using the PRN doses, I think, is really great um, for a few reasons, um, but I think the most important one is that it gives the patient the power to decide when and if they need more methadone. You know, inpatient management in general can be a little bit of a power struggle between the patient and staff. You know, the, the patient being an expert in their own body, the providers are being experts in evidence-based care, the nurses are experts in med administrations. Um, and so that this PRN as needed doses give some of that power back to the patient to decide when and if they need it. So this is the regimen that's suggested by an author in a really great paper. Um, it's called Adapting Methadone in the Era of Fentanyl, where they call out just the, the inadequacy of what we're doing with methadone doses. Uh, this is a strategy that they used for dosing, uh, where they essentially went up to 50 milligrams on day one, 60 day two, 80 on day three, and then they did a slightly more aggressive dose suggestion that we were used to of 10 to 20 every four days. It is important still to use your full agonist that I've highlighted on the side. Uh, I think this is probably a good place to start if you're an institution who is already used to doing the standard methadone induction and looking to be a little bit more aggressive in the setting of fentanyl. Uh, there, so at OHSU, we're trialing a new protocol where we essentially get the patient to 60 milligrams on day one, 70 on day two, 80 on day three. We utilize some split doses in there and then PRN, so we're just slightly more aggressive than this protocol. We haven't evaluated the outcomes of that yet, um, so kind of TBD. At Swedish, I know they're being a little bit more aggressive than us even. Uh, they do 20 to 30 milligrams twice daily and then a 10 Q4 hours. Um, some protocols up there even describe a 20 milligrams every six hours with strong holding parameters. That essentially gets them to 80 milligrams on day one. So there's lots of different strategies, strategies out there. I do think a lot of us utilize the split dosing, so that's an important thing to, to consider when, when um, uh, starting your high induction protocol. Uh, one more just little quick tip to think about too as well is previously tolerated methadone doses. So if someone very recently tolerated, let's say 150 of methadone, and then returned to use, you can consider more rapidly getting them back to that dose over two to three days, just knowing that that 150 milligrams did not cause them sedation before. A few patient populations that I would be really cautious in doing this methadone rapid titration in, if they have any type of end organ failure, if they have a prolonged QTC, if you're concurrently giving them benzodiazepines, they're a little bit older, the methadone metabolism changes in older patients, and then if they're on any strong CYP3A4 inhibitors, which will increase the methadone metabolism or the methadone serum level at baseline. Some discharge considerations with methadone, you know, it just adds an extra complexity of care transitions. Um, many OTPs are closed on the weekends. There's limited hours for intakes. Um, it's almost nearly 100% always a barrier to sniff placement. Um, so, uh, you know, the best practice is connect the methadone maintenance treatment at discharge. Um, my next slide, I'll talk about some ways to, to get around that a little bit. Uh, just as a quick uh, reminder, cannot prescribe methadone at discharge for OUD, but you should always prescribe naloxone. And then another little tip, if the patient's not going to continue methadone at discharge, you just used it while they're hospitalized um, to control their acute withdrawal, make sure they get their dose on the day before they leave. As I'd mentioned earlier in the overdose, the risk factors for overdoses, you have a reduced tolerance because they're hospitalized. They just came out of an acute illness. Um, they're going to be rushing to use because they're withdrawing, and so that's a huge overdose risk. So please, if possible, make sure they get their methadone before they leave. So last year, two years ago, um, there was some exciting change to the federal code. So previously, the federal code allowed for 72 hours of methadone administration outside of the OTP, and that's what essentially allowed for spot dosing in the ED or through OB triage. 
um, for missed doses or for missed OTP appointments. And then in 2021, the, in this era of COVID, the federal code updated to allow dispensing of opiates for up to 72 hours. I do say opiates and not just methadone. What I'm going to talk to about in the next slides is applicable to methadone, but this can be used for any opiate. It's not specifically for methadone. Um, the, it was really great that they said this, um, that, that they made this change. However, it is really tricky to implement because dispensing of narcotics is really outside the standard hospital workflow. So a lot of institutions have struggled of really what to do with this information. It is important though, um, it does ease some of our discharge difficulties that we've experienced and we've had quite a few hospital days saved since implementing this as well. So what this essentially means is someone who would normally be ready to discharge on Friday, their OTP appointment is until Monday, so we kind of keep them in the hospital for that Saturday, Sunday to give them their methadone so they don't withdraw. Um, but other than that, that's the only thing that keeps them in the hospital. Um, so if we're able to send them home with essentially two days of take home, that's two days of hospital days saved. There's a few tips. If you are a hospital system that's interested in exploring this further, please email me. I can share with you more in depth of what we've learned and things to avoid. But basic steps would be just to apply for a DEA exemption. Uh, you can do it through two exemptions, one that could be individual, DEA exemptions or it can be institutional. The institutional one I think is great because then it covers all providers who have prescribing authority at your institution and not just individual ones, but that's something that you can decide. It is very pharmacy um, heavy. The workload is mostly falls onto the pharmacist. So find a pharmacy champion that's gonna work with you for this. Uh, developing a really strong, clear dispensing procedure step-by-step -step instructions and even screenshots I found were really helpful of manipulations that require in the EMR to get the proper labels. And then develop clinician workflows. Um, determine a standard for how providers are can communicate that methadone take-home doses are needed. Develop standard EMR documentation of it. Um, and then educate uh, you know, the nurses, the pharmacists, the staff, the nurses required a lot of education on our part here just to know the legality of it. And then we also found that reaching out to our local OTPs just to let them know that this is a process that we'll be starting. So they weren't blindsided and, and knew they were coming. Uh, I think one of our big concerns is if they didn't know and then they assumed that the patient you know, didn't have the, those three days of methadone, they would have inappropriately dose reduced them. We do also tell our patients to keep all their empty containers and bring them with them to their OTP appointment almost as proof. Again, email me if you're an institution who's interested in doing that. Um, I'm gonna quickly go over BUP. Jenny Hartley did a really good job of this, um, of talking about the buprenorphine. And I think I'm a little short on time, so I'm gonna skip this slide. Administration, she talked about administration in the hospital. Uh, don't put it in the medication cup. You know, as most meds, the they are put in a medi medication cup. The is handed to the patient. The patient swallows it. The nurse charts on all of them. Uh, make sure bup is is specifically not put in that cup. Uh, put standard language on the bup administrations on your EMR. And then I get this question a lot, what happens if it goes in the cup and the patient swallows it? I say repeat it at the full dose, so 100%. Uh, some people say 80% of the dose, uh, anywhere from 80% of the dose I think is reasonable to repeat with. Uh, but the bioavailability of it is very poor. So very little if that's gonna reach their serum. Lots of different ways to transition on to bup. Um, Jenny talked about a lot of these. So I'm really going to pop to our standard low dose induction looks like this. Um, this is pretty conservative, I would say, if you're a health system who's just looking to get their toes wet with this, this is a really good place to start. Unfortunately, it, it takes about six days to get up to a blocking dose. And then I do just wanna highlight the, the last column, those full agonists continuing them is really important. Uh, ideally, that full agonist would be with methadone, but if you're not quite there yet, um, oxycodone and morphine are good options. And then you really wanna continue that until you get to a proper blocking dose, and that's usually around eight to 12 milligrams. After that, the full agonist can be stopped unless they're being needed for acute pain, and then continue on with the, the full agonist for pain. 
This is our rapid low dose induction that we just started doing. Um, we've had really good success with this. Uh, so we essentially get the patient up to a blocking dose at day four. Um, once they get that nine milligrams, or sorry, the eight milligrams at nine o'clock, uh, you know, eight milligrams of bup on day four really isn't going to hold it for a lot of these patients. And so they do get more doses in the afternoon, anywhere from four to eight milligrams more. So we'll get them up to 16, sometimes 24 milligrams on that day four using other doses. But the eight milligrams is really where you, the, on day four is where you can feel comfortable stopping the full agonist. This is an example of a low dose induction IV, if that's something that your institution is interested in. Uh, how do I get 0.5 milligrams? So the smallest dose that it comes in is two milligrams. So you really just have to kind of crumble it essentially to get that 0.5 milligram doses. There is stability out there for split films, but not for quartered films. Uh, if your institution is one where, that allows nurses to split or quarter tablets on the floor, that's great. If, it's, if you're restricted to pharmacy, splitting them, uh, you know, quartering of the doses isn't really gonna work from a stability standpoint. We chose to add a patch to our formulary to get around that. Belbuca um, is a, another sublingual formulation of bup. Uh, different bioavailability for sure, and around 225 micrograms of the Belbuca is about 0.6 of Suboxone. I'm going to completely skip over this because Jenny did that. California Bridge Quick Start. This was really done in the ED setting um, where you essentially wait for the person to get into withdrawal. You give uh, anywhere from 8 to 16 of bup. If it's improved, you can continue on with it. Um, we're doing this, I would say, intermittently in our ED, but it's not terribly common. And then the Boulder Quick Start, the one thing I'll say about that is that I don't think this is a great spot for inpatient initiation. The, I think it relies heavily on supportive care medications and those and timely administration of the supportive care medications. Uh, nothing timely happens in the hospital. And so I think there would be probably too much of a lag to get these patients really the supportive medications that they need. So I would not recommend doing this in the hospital. Uh, buprenorphine in the setting of fentanyl. We've talked about this because I think this next slide, I really want to spend more time on it. So periop bup. Um, so there was an old recommendation to stop or to, to reduce bup. And that really came about from some case reports of difficult to treat analgesia. And then, you know, in retrospect, I think it's probably just a reflective of challenges that comes with acute, treating acute pain in these opioid intolerant patients and not specifically from the bup itself. ASAM National Practice Guidelines um, say don't stop the bup, continue it. Um, just use higher potency full agonists. A uh, few strategies to be successful from it. You can split the, the buprenorphine dose up. The analgesic duration is is less than that to prevent withdrawal. So splitting that total daily dose up into two or three times a day is super advantageous. Um, you can also use PRN doses of bup, so two or four milligrams PRN. You could increase their maintenance dose. Uh, make sure you utilize your non-opiate analgesics. So use your gabapentin, your EDSEDs, lidocaine, ketamine, if your institution allows it. Um, Use appropriate doses of philagonists. Again, this is not 5 to 15 of oxycodone. Um, if you're comfortable with it, use hydromorphone. I like that a little bit better in this situation. And then just, I know there's no great um, morphine equivalents out there, and we don't normally can consider buprenorphine part of morphine equivalents per day. But if you just think that one milligram of buprenorphine is equal to around 20 milligrams of morphine, if someone's maintained on 16 milligrams of bup and then we stop that for surgery, you're gonna have to replace that with a very crazy amount of full agonist in order just to fill up those mu receptors. So that would be over 300 milligrams of morphine if you stop 16 milligrams of bup. And that just sets the patient up for an increased risk of respiratory depression. So just generally stay away from it. I do also think it's important to point out here, this can be a very vulnerable time for patients. Surgery in general is really anxiety provoking. These patients can have extra concern around the stigma from their substance use disorder. They could be scared about receiving inadequate pain relief and then actually might be receiving suboptimal pain regimen. They could experience withdrawal if their view is held or reduced and not appropriately replaced with a full agonist. You know, withdrawal on top of acute post-op pain just sounds so traumatizing. 
So this is a very scary time for patients and taking away a stabilizing therapy like bup can be very, very detrimental. Discharge considerations for buprenorphine, no more X waiver, that went away, which is super exciting. So now any provider that has Schedule Three prescribing privileges can do it. It was mentioned earlier, there's no more prior authorization for doses above 24 milligrams on care organ patients. Um, Oh no. Sorry, my computers. Can you guys see my auto power off screen? No, we can see the patient case. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, so I just want to run through a patient case of uh, how you can implement some of these strategies. So this is our patient, 34 year old, presents to the ED. Um, she's here for treatment of absences. She endorses using uh, 10 to 15 milligrams of fentanyl a day. Uh, you go to see her, um, you know, you know, asking, you're asking not to judge, um, but just want to make sure that she's appropriately treated so she can stay for her IV antibiotics. Um, you talk about withdrawal, man, or that she is in withdrawal right now. Um, you start to bring up the two options that you could do methadone or buprenorphine. She can't tolerate that conversation, so you say, Okay, what I'm going to do now is just I'm going to give you some methadone, uh, help control your, your acute withdrawals, and then <coughs> I'll come back this afternoon and talk to you about other options. And then just make sure you let her know you have all your supportive care medications on there. It sounds like you're feeling really anxious right now, so I'm going to have your nurse bring you in some um, uh, hydroxyzine as well as some clonidine for your restless. Next slide, please. So you give the patient 30 milligrams of methadone, you come back that afternoon. Um, she says she's feeling a li little bit better, is engaging in conversation, um, says that she wants to go on bup, she doesn't wanna present with OTP every day. And so you say, okay, I think we should do this low dose induction. I'm gonna give you some methadone for the next few days. That's gonna acutely take care of your withdrawal needs. And then um, uh, we'll get you transitioned over to buprenorphine kind of in the background. Hopefully that'll prevent, prevent some of your precipitated withdrawal. So later on that day, you slap that patch, the buprenorphine 20 microgram patch on there. Day two, you keep marching up on that methadone as needed. So you give her 40 and then she has some PRN doses available to her. You start that bup one milligram sublingual three times a day and then continue that oxycodone for cravings or withdrawal. Next slide, Paul. Uh, day three, you can give her methadone, 50 milligrams with some additional PRN, gets her up to 70 milligrams potentially on that day. Here's where it gets maybe a little bit tricky um, as far as her experience. She may start feeling a little bit bad around this time. Uh, that's where you really want to rely on the supportive medications that make sure she uses that oxycodone as needed. Um, but essentially, you start that bup one milligram every three hours as needed for six doses. She tolerates it pretty well, surprisingly. And then this next day on day four, you um, are really going to get to your blocking dose of your buprenorphine. You could give them that methadone 50 milligrams once if the patient preferred. It's not necessary because you'll end up getting to a full blocking dose of buprenorphine on that day. Uh, but a lot of our patients prefer just to have kind of that security blanket of the methadone given in the morning. But now your patient has officially transitioned onto buprenorphine um, while using methadone to treat their acute withdrawal. Next slide. Um, so in the hospital, if needed to, to use for pain control, you can split that total daily dose up into three times a day. Um, and then when they go home, you can consolidate it to once a day, or if the patient prefers using three times a day, if I found that more helpful, um, that could be continued as well. How am I doing on time, Paul? Do I need to stop? Paul, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I didn't want to be on while you on the mic while you were on there. Um, yeah, yeah. I I would think if you can wrap it up in the next couple minutes would be great. We're probably going to try to run questions till the top of the hour, but you seem like you're close anyway. So just thunder across the finish line, friend. Great. Uh, let's just pop over to our pregnant. If you could pop over to my pregnant slides, then I'll just highlight those ones. Oh, great. It's the next one. Um, I saw a few comments in the chat about it. And really, this uh, you could dedicate a whole two hour on this topic alone. These three slides feel wholly inadequate. Uh, I do just want to stress a few things that we can start doing now for these patients. 
This graph, I think, is a super powerful one. It came from a study in 2022 that saw uh, over an 81 percent increase in pregnancy associated overdose deaths. Um, most of that was in the pregnant and postpartum time period, which is very scary. Uh, a few metabolic changes that happens in pregnancy that really affects our drugs, the buprenorphine and methadone. You get an increase in blood volume, um, which, enhance, which then in turn increases the clearance of these drugs. And then you get a decrease in albumin, um, which the, both of those bup and methadone are bound to, which also increases excretion of the medications. And probably the biggest factor is you get an increase in CYP3A4 metabolism. And so you're just going to chew through the bup and methadone much faster than you would if you're not pregnant. A pretty important point here is that this CYP3A4 metabolism doesn't automatically correct as soon as you give birth. That persists for 8 to 12 weeks postpartum. And so uh, automatically reducing our methadone and bup doses is not appropriate anymore. If you go to the next slide. Uh, ACOG has a really good opiate agonist piece out there. It's very inclusive. It's really great if you haven't read it. I encourage you doing that. They have no preference of bup over methadone, whatever the patient prefers. They do say bup or methadone over abstinence. Uh, some few quick things on methadone specifically. We see plasma levels decline as soon as 10 weeks, but the biggest change is really in the third trimester. This is where we really have to split that dose. Single daily doses is oftentimes not appropriate for these people anymore. Um, you really have to titrate their dose up fairly aggressively as well. And then because of that um, continued CYP3A4 hypermetabolism, don't immediately reduce that dose postpartum. Uh, they should be continued on the higher dose and or split dosing for up to, to 12 weeks after delivery. Buprenorphine, same situation, split up that dosing. You can titrate up to 32 milligrams, sometimes even more than that because of the hypermetabolism. The mono product is generally preferred, although either really can be used. There's no contra, you know, true contraindication to using the naloxone in pregnancy. Um, and then naloxone, naloxone, naloxone at discharge, please. Next slide, Paul. This is just one case report. Um, this was done in the setting of fentanyl. It's a 24-week patient. I think it's actually pretty interesting and something that uh, we sh should cons be considered doing for our patient. Uh, the actual therapy that the patient received is slightly different than this, but this was the table that they said, you know, if we had to do it all over again, this is the, the dosing strategy that they recommend, where they essentially got that patient to 60 milligrams using some split dosing. Kept it there for three days, 90 for three days. And then this patient eventually discharged on day six at 120 milligrams. So they actually got the patient up pretty quickly um, to an appropriate dose for them. They did utilize uh, a, a fairly significant amount of morphine equivalents every day. So in addition to this methadone, they got anywhere from 40 to eight milligrams of morphine per day, um, but there's no safety outcomes or no adverse safety outcomes, I'm sorry. Um, it's very limited data, but it's something to think about for sure. And then my last big important point here, if you're not comfortable with either methadone or buprenorphine, just use your short acting opiates. We all are pretty comfortable with oxycodone, um, sometimes hydromorphone. Utilize those for acute withdrawal. Um, Patient directed discharge, send the naloxone early, have oral antibiotic treatment options noted in the chart. And then I'll briefly just talk of harm reduction supplies. I wish I had more time for this. Uh, again, this could also be a whole, a whole other lecture. Uh, harm reduction is evidence-based. It's a practical set of strategies to reduce negative consequences of substance use. Um, many people are not willing or able to abstain from it and abstinence should not be a precondition to help Next slide. So partner with the person what they're most concerned about. Are they most concerned about overdose? Make sure you have them naloxone. Uh, are they most concerned about HIV or hep C? Getting them sterile syringes would be good. Um, encouraging smoking over IV use. Make sure that they have proper wound care, um, safer sex kits, oral kits, and um, you know, fentanyl test strips. Next. 
slide. This uh, we are very lucky at OHSU to have a um, harm or care harm reduction nurse um, that actually partners with the patients and provides them with some supplies. So this is an example of our wound care kit. Next. We also offer safer sex and or oral care kits. Next, and then we can give them syringes and sharps container. Those are some harm reduction uh, resources. Uh, Next Distro is actually a pretty good one where they'll actually mail supplies out to the patient. If you are an inpatient and you have a really tricky person, you need some help, OHSU has a consult line. Um, the, you call this number, ask to be connected to addiction consult line, and then you'll actually speak to one of our addictions care physicians and they'll be able to assist you in uh, managing your patients. And then if you're a hospital system, who wants some more targeted education or assistance in developing order sets or policy, please email me. I'd be super happy to help um, you on that path. That's all I had. Emily, you're unbelievable, as are all of our presenters here today. We uh, are so grateful for all three of you uh, participating and be so generous with engaging with folks here today. We are nearing the end of our time together here, folks. We're going to try to stretch out a little bit more uh, if folks want to hang out, you're more than welcome to until the top of the hour while we try to answer a few more questions. Before we do, I just want to give some folks some housekeeping information, and then we'll uh, segue over to questions on here today. Everyone who registered in this session here today, um, if your email is in there correctly, I'm going to send you out an email today that's going to have all of the information you need to claim either CME or CU credits. It is really fast and super easy. Um, my one caveat on that is try to see if you can do it before Monday so that we can get these out to everyone promptly. It's also going to be an email containing links to all of the resources that we talked about today, including the full slide deck. So you'll have access to all that stuff, all those links, registration for our next sessions, everything that you need will be in that email and you have a chance to enroll right away in next month's SUD and hospice palliative care session, an aspect of substance use disorder that does not get nearly as much focus as it could, but where the need is profound. So I encourage you to check that out if you're curious at all. So watch for that email here today. It's going to handle everything else that you may need. What I'd like to do now, because no one's better positioned to help triage some of these questions, is hand the mic over to my good friend, Stacy, who's going to help take us through as many questions as we can handle in the next uh, 12 minutes. Stacy, take it away. Thanks, Paul. And thank you, Emily, for your presentation. Um, you know, I think what I'd like to do actually first is just thank Amanda and Jenny for answering so many questions in the chat live. Thank you very much. Um, and then ask them, is there anything that you would like to speak to verbally that you already answered in the chat so we can get it on the recording? Did anything feel like you'd like to expand on now? We had some questions about pregnancy and then Jenny, I don't know if you saw the questions about um, just more specifics around um, adjunct medications. So I'll I'll just see if either of you want to expand on any of your comments first. Hi, I've been really having a blast in the Q&As. I think I got to most of them. Honestly, it was just really fun just typing out some um, an answers. Ooh, Maria. Um, I'm trying to scroll up to your original question because I, I did see it. Um, I think wasn't it about I think Maria question was about um, um, OTPs. I can't search the chat. There's so many things in the chat, um, but there's a lot of things, a lot of themes kind of being um, talked about in the chat. One of the things that came up over and over and over again is can we use opioid agonists in outpatient settings to support our patients? Um, I would say that there's nobody in Oregon yet that is thinking about using this or is doing this on a broad scale uh, or like really any scale that I'm aware of, but I want y'all to be aware that there are individuals that are have been utilized, uh, like individual clinics on the East Coast that have been utilizing the 72-hour rule, rule to start people on methadone and transition them to an OTP. And also <clears throat> use agonist to cross titrate with um, 
buprenorphine. I put that abstract in the Q&A. Hopefully y'all have access to that. It's something you can review and think through. We're looking that, at that as an option for us. We're looking at it primarily at um, Hooper, um, although we're thinking about other ways we could apply that. Um, there's some regulatory things to really look through. You've got to have a brave um, and collaborative partner in your compliance slash safety realm if you've got an organization big enough to have that. Um, and there's lots of folks available to get, um, get you know, resources and information from. Um, I also am hearing a lot of questions about pregnancy. I wanted to make sure y'all were aware that our original thinking about pregnancy and withdrawal, which was based on kind of uh, case reviews, case reports, case series, small case series in the 70s that withdrawal ends pregnancies, causes miscarriage, causes stillbirth, et cetera, has really been uh, disproven by a problematic but relatively good study um, from about a decade ago. I put the abstract of that study in the chat. I'd encourage you to look at it. I you know, used to practice a lot of obstetrics and haven't really in the last few years, but um, what I learned from a couple decades of doing that work is that um, I want to minimize withdrawal for all my patients, especially pregnant patients. There's lots of reasons to make sure that folks are really comfortable with those transitions, but the withdrawal they experience isn't linked with um, pregnancy complications directly. So, um, and it's really important to support them on to a medication um, that treats their opioid use disorder, and sometimes that's just inevitable. Um, what else? Um, Anything else anybody's noticed from the chat that would be especially good to address? Uh, we had lots of questions earlier about quick start and using the Oh yeah. And their well, answer, we, but I just want to touch on that. Yeah, I would really make sure um, that um, I would really make sure that you, I put a link in the ch chat to um, um, the quick start method, which would be, you know, what we're talking about in using that language is um, self-administration of Narcan with um, uh, buprenorphine initiation and with adjunctive medication use. It does result in pretty severe withdrawal symptoms, although that varies, but they're short-lived. And it can be a great option for individuals who really feel like that's the right fit for what they need. Um, and it's just another wonderful tool in our toolbox as we address um, buprenorphine transitions in the fentanyl era. They have, they're very generous to have shared their method, their PowerPoint presentation, um, some handouts, some information, Information, and I link to that in the Q&A as well. Um, and Dr. Ryan was actually on this, so um, thanks Dr. Ryan for making sure those um, that information is available to folks. Um, Maria, you were wondering how to help get folks to a comfortable methadone fa dose faster. Really tricky. So Emily presented some amazing techniques for getting folks onto a, um, an acceptable, a comfortable methadone dose faster um, in the hospital setting. Um, I think it can be really tricky, and I know that you primarily work for pregnant um, and early postpartum individuals, um, and what I know is that when I was doing a lot of maternity care, I was utilizing my triage space a lot for this kind of up titration. Um, I was lucky to be practicing uh, maternity care mostly when in the heroin era, which was a little easier to make these transitions, but I think we just have to be really creative about linking tightly with an OTP, having really um, seamless um, working clinical working relationships with OTPs where you can um, get somebody started on a methadone dose, potentially in an inpatient realm or with the partnership of an OTP that is willing to kind of work with you and your patient um, to support safe up titration on an outpatient um, setting. I think that really like for us, it's involved like making phone calls, going to Oregon Society of Addiction Medicine networking events and clinical um, communities of practice conversations, um, getting folks in my phone, giving them calls, doing emails, you know, making sure I'm talking to the OTP leadership. And that's what I do in my role as a leader. But a lot of y'all are going to be leaders in your community of practice as well, in your clinics, et cetera. And that's what it, that's what it takes. Um, 
so you know it'll look it's pretty labor intensive but that's part of what is all you know addiction medicine is all about it's it's a it's a realm that requires a lot of really like high level complex care coordination um and and maria I'd, I'd be very happy to talk to you more about this i can give you some specific examples of things that we've found to be really helpful and successful thanks amanda yeah what else well, one, yeah i see one question that I, i'm i'm gonna guess we'd want to expand on it's around the uh, the role of urine drug testing oh in yeah UAs. and mm -hmm. the specific question was around uh fentanyl um it's not it's not screening for fentanyl so just mm -hmm. i'll hand that over to you to answer yeah well jenny and i have been on a bit of a journey here with this right so i would have to say that in my day-to-day -day clinical practice i make all of my decisions about uh, medication management based on patient history i may send out some confirmations from time to time if my clinical history doesn't jive you know doesn't match with what um what i'm seeing um in a and, and, you know, I, I work in some settings where we really do rely on drug screening for other purposes, you know, for kind of monitoring of success and treatment and that kind of stuff, along with other clinical data. Um, for a little while, so we were encouraged to distribute um, fentanyl test strips to our patients for them to test their drugs. These were fentanyl test strips that were originally designed for, they're usually labeled as for forensic use, which means that they're not CLIA waived, therefore, folks to use sort of in non-clinical settings. Um, and we decided that we would do a workaround where we would hand these test strips to patients and um, we would have them self-test their urine and self-report the result. And that way we would know on admission to Hooper what was going on with them. Um, we were doing this for a while and we actually got a visit from an FDA um, official who would, had heard about what we were doing came to visit us and said if if this is something that you are offering patients you need to stop because these are not CLIA wave tests and they're not FDA approved for low complexity use so we stopped um, we have there has been advocacy for um, approving um, point of care tests for fentanyl for low complexity CLIA waived use for years um, I'm not aware of any movement on that realm and so we just got to do our best i'm learning too you know as i use um some send outs that you know those send outs aren't always helpful so what i really you know the the clinical standard i i talk to folks about in my in my seat as um as medical director here at ccc is that we're not gonna you know we can't we can't determine what's going on with somebody clinically just based on their urine drug testing results and that we need to piece together information from you know their clinical presentation their clinical history if somebody's not being you know disclosing their use we're just going to have to use other ways of just really assessing how that person is doing um, and that can be tricky and you know we really like having that like yes no but that's just where we are with fentanyl and I, I'm confident that we're making pretty good clinical decisions without that that data. Thank you, Amanda. Jenny, anything you want to add to that answer? Um, I would just echo everything Amanda said, and we make all our decisions here based on uh, what the patient says. And um, to be honest, I don't I don't think in our setting, I don't think it would really change really anything no. about our practice at all if we had. Um, if we had uh, UDSs that tested for fentanyl. I wish that we did simply because I think that we should um, have clear way of test, but um, I don't think it would change a whole lot. Yeah, I agree. We were really interested in having fentanyl testing available so that we could provide patients with feedback about their, you know, whether or not their methamphetamines were adulterated with fentanyl or other drugs they were using. And we occasionally did find folks that were, it was a surprise to them that their urine was testing positive for fentanyl. And it was a helpful moment to be able to talk to them about that. We aren't able to do that anymore. And I don't really know, you know, we had to stop doing this about six months ago. And so I don't really know what's happening with our drug supply. Um, and it would be nice to know. Yeah, agree. That would be the one, the one, um, a one, one really important reason to have it because I think people um, anecdotally are telling us that they are, that they know that there's fentanyl in their methamphetamines because it's putting them to sleep, not keeping them awake. And um, so it would be terrific to have confirmation of that and to be able to let all the folks know that aren't able to really clearly identify that that this is happening. 
Excellent. And I think where we're at the top of the hour, we should go ahead and release our attendees back into the wild because uh, I know time is valuable for folks. Uh, Jennifer, Amanda, Emily, Stacy, we cannot even begin to express our thanks to you enough for what you've done today. It's absolutely amazing that uh, you've created a, a huge thing. And uh, I have no doubt in my mind that, that lives will be saved as a result of what we did here today. So I feel really great about that. And uh, excited for the hope that was brought out into the community as a result of our getting to do this time today. So uh, the email's going out to everyone. Uh, really, really great. So look for that here today. Respond. We'll take care of everything. Thank you so much for everything you do for uh, healthcare in Oregon. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, folks. Thank you for coming today. We'll see you at our next MedZ. Be well.